ಯಸ್ಮೈಗುರುವೆ ನಮ ನಮೋ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪದಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪೃಷ್ಠಾಯ ಭೂತಲೆ ಶ್ರೀಮತಿ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮಿ ನಾಮನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವೆ ಗೌರವಾಣಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷಶನ್ಯವಾರಿ ಪಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯೇಶಣೆ ವಂಚಕೌಪಾತರುಭ್ಯ ಕೃಪಾ ಸಿಂಧುಬಾಯೇವ ಪತಿತ ಭವಾನೇಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ಜಯ ಶ್ರೀಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾಧಾರ ಶ್ರೀವಾಸತಿ ಗೋರ್ ಭಕ್ತವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ ಹರೇ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ ಹರೆ ರಾಮ 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 ಹರೆ ಹರೆ ವಿ ವಾಕಮ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ವನ್ ಟು ಅವರ್ ಆನ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಸ್ಟಡಿ ಆಫ್ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ವರ್ ಇನ್ ದರ್ಡ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟೋ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ವಿರ್ ಜಸ್ಟ್ ಕಂಪ್ಲೀಟಿಂಗ್ ಕಪಿಲ ಶಿಕ್ಷಾ ಟುಡೇ ಟುಡೇ ವಿರ್ ಆನ್ ದ ಫೈನಲ್ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ತರ್ಡ್ ಕ್ಯಾಂಟೋ ಚಾಪ್ಟರ್ ನಂಬರ್ ತರ್ಟಿ ತ್ರೀ ಓಕೆ so i'll just share the screen here okay chapter number 33 activities of kapila here's an overview of the chapter we begin with prayers by devahuti because lord kapila has completed his teaching he's answered all of her inquiries he's answered all of her questions and now devahuti is offering her prayers to lord kapila dev that's the first eight verses and then lord kapila will give final instructions to devahuti before leaving he will depart he won't stay with her he's already finished teaching her there's no need for him to stay any longer with her so he's going off to travel and then takes 13 up to 32 we'll hear about how devahuti achieved perfection the result of her practicing everything she learned from lord kapila dev and then we will hear for just a couple of verses the activities of lord kapila what did he do after he left devahuti and then again a phala shruti we had yesterday also phala shruti another phala shruti right this is we had one from lord kapila this is one coming maybe from i, I can't remember now maybe it's from sukadev got our uh, maitreya reciting to vidura Okay so here's the first text Maitreya Vacha Sri Maitreya said thus Devahuti the mother of Lord Kapila and wife of Gurdama Muni became freed from all ignorance concerning devotional service and transcendental knowledge she offered her obeisances unto the Lord the author of the basic principles of the sankhya system of philosophy which is the background of liberation and she satisfied him with the following verses of prayer oh <laughs> let's go back but this is text number 4 uh, we'll just let I'll let you read I'll read for you text number 2 first of all because we had text number 1 there maitreya speaking then text number 2 devahuti said brahma is said to be unborn because he takes birth from the lotus flower which grows from your abdomen while you lie in the ocean at the horizon of the universe but even brahma simply meditated upon you whose body is the source of unlimited universes 
So Brahma also meditates on Lord Kapila. And then text number three. My dear Lord, although personally you have nothing to do, you have, dis you have distributed your energies in the interactions of the material modes of nature. And for that reason, the creation, maintenance and dissolution of the cosmic manifestation take place. My dear Lord, you are self-determined and are the Supreme Personality of Godhead for all living entities. For them, you created this material manifestation, and although you are one, the diverse energies can act multifariously. This is inconceivable to us. Yeah, definitely, the Lord's energies are inconceivable to us. How his energies can perform so many inconceivable feats beyond the power of our mind and senses to understand. We have to hear. So Devahuti is appreciating this inconceivable aspect of the Lord. And then she continues here, text number four. And you can see the nice illustration also relating to her prayer. Text number four says, As the Supreme Personality of Godhead, you have taken birth from my abdomen. O oh my Lord, how is that possible for the Supreme One, who has in his belly all the cosmic manifestation? The answer is that it is possible for, at the end of the millennium, you lie down on a leaf of a banyan tree, and just like a small baby, you lick the toe of your lotus foot. So Devahuti's prayer is really very nice. She, she's saying, how is it possible that you could appear in my belly? when the whole cosmic manifestation is coming from your belly. So how could you come from my belly? But then she gives an example by which we can understand something of the inconceivable potencies of the Lord, how he lays down on the leaf of a banyan tree at the time of the millennium, the end of the, the devastation. He lays down on the leaf and sucks his toe. I'll read the purport. At the time of dissolution, the Lord sometimes appears as a small baby lying on a leaf of a banyan tree, floating on the devastating water. Therefore, Devahuti suggests, you're lying down within the abdomen of a common woman like me is not so astonishing. You can lie down on the leaf of a banyan tree and float on the water of devastation as a small baby. It is not very wonderful, therefore, that you can lie down in the abdomen of my body. You teach us that those who are very fond of children within this material world and who therefore enter into marriage to enjoy family life with children can also have the Supreme Personality of Godhead as their child. And the most wonderful thing is that the Lord himself licks his toe. Since all the great sages and devotees apply all energy and all activities in the service of the lotus feet of the Lord, there must be some transcendental pleasure in the toes of his lotus feet. The Lord licks his toe to taste the nectar for which the devotees always aspire. Sometimes the Supreme Personality of Godhead himself wonders how much transcendental pleasure is within himself. And in order to taste his own potency, he sometimes takes the position of tasting himself. Lord Chaitanya is Krishna himself, but he appears as a devotee 
to taste the sweetness of the transcendental mellow in himself, which is tasted by Srimati Radharani, the greatest of all devotees. <laughs> it's a very nice pastime here, that the Lord sucking his toe. We are also trying to taste the nectar from the toe of the Lord. We're always trying to absorb our minds in the lotus feet of the Lord. Here's another prayer in the same topic from the Bao Mukundastikam by Bhuva Mangal Thakur. With his lotus hand, he places his lotus foot in his lotus mouth. I meditate on that baby Mukunda lying on the leaf of a banyan tree. Okay. Going ahead, text number five. My dear Lord, you have assumed this body in order to diminish the sinful activities of the fallen and to enrich their knowledge in devotion and liberation. Since these sinful people are dependent on your direction, by your own will you assume incarnations as a boar and as other forms. Similarly, you have appeared in order to distribute transcendental knowledge to your dependents. So Devahuti is just describing the mission of the Lord, as we know, that comes to give knowledge, to establish real devotion, to establish dharma, and to remove the demons, to give pleasure to the devotees. So, no, nothing very contradictory. Now, text number six is really a very important verse, and is certainly one of the memorization verses which you all have to know. So you can all chant. Let me hear all of you recite this verse. Yes, very good. And who knows why this verse is so important? Is glorifying the holy name. Well, in what way is it glorifying the holy name? It's not only glorifying the holy name, there's other types of devotional service there. Even a low one person also can get the devotional service by glorifying the holy name. A low-born person can get devotional service. Mm. Yes. When we were studying nectar of devotion, have, you've already studied nectar of devotion, right? Yes, Maharaj. Uh -huh. So maybe you remember about the discussion there about how devotional service removes all the different phases of sinful reactions. How there's a stockpile of sins. Remember the different stages of sinful reactions? Do you remember that? There were four, di four different stages recognized of sinful reactions, how they manifest? One of them is Papam. Papam? Well, that's sin. <laughs> but. What are, the, what are the different stages? Kutam, Bijam, Svanarabh. Kutam, Bijam. Aparabh and Parabh. Yes, Aparabh and Parabh, right. So Parabdha Karma. Parabdha Karma means the sins which are manifest in the body. Right? Our bodies are all manifest with our Parabdha Karma. We have our Parabdha Karma in our body. But this verse describes 
that simply by doing activities like chanting the holy name or bowing down or hearing the glories of the Lord or remembering the Lord, these different activities, that even doing them one time, that they can destroy even parabdha karma. That is very special. Something which can actually change our parabdha karma. The sins which are manifest in our body can be removed by pure devotional service. Of course, it's not just anybody chanting the holy name, but it's pure chanting of the holy name. When we engage in pure devotional service, we know there's qualities in devotional service. So when we actually engage in pure devotional service, then we can get the benefit of that. So th this is a very... Yeah, could we ask it, people, if you, you know, if you have talking in the background, can you switch off your mic, please, not to distract the class? Yes, Prabhu, your question? Yes, Maharaj, please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, actually, uh, in this one you said that if we chant the holy name uh, in a pure way or we are in the pure devotional service, uh, this verse is very important from the point of view of personal application, like how to uh, basically understand this because uh, we are in the devotional service and we are trying and struggling to do the uh, pure devotional service. But how to understand and remember this always that we have to basically understand the power of the holy name that it can relieve us of all the tarap karmas. Well, you have to just simply read this verse and you have to read the purport and you can read the Acharya's commentary on this verse and, be, and you, can, you have to convince yourself that this is a statement of the Shastras. We're, we accept the Shastras as absolute. So it's just describing here the power of the holy name. The holy, not only if he chants or if he hears about his pastimes, offers him obeisances or even remembers him. Even if you're born in a family of dog eaters. So if it's true for someone born in a family of dog eaters, won't it be even more true for a devotee who's strictly practicing the regulative principles? and who's engaged in, in serious devotional practices, then certainly you'll get the benefit. Yes, Maharaj. So what you are saying is, uh, Maharaj, that uh, we practice the four regulative principles, follow the process, have full faith in the word of these scriptures, and keep on moving on the process that and read the purport of this sloka again and again to remind ourselves the power of the willing. Yes, not only the power of the holy name, the power of all the devotional practices. Yes, Maharaj. So it said even a per person born in the family of dog eaters becomes eligible to perform a Vedic sacrifice. Of course, you'd have to be trained how to perform the Vedic sacrifice, but he is eligible. Hmm? So this is this is a very powerful statement, and this is a, this is telling this is impressing on us the power of devotional activities, and if we perform these activities with sincerity and pure devotion then certainly we'll get the results. So yes, David, Maharaj, in this, in this purport, Maharaj, it is mentioned that uh, if by chanting or hearing once in pureness or in an offenseless manner, he is immediately relieved of the sinful reaction. Yes. So, uh, by chanting or hearing once in pureness. So how to understand this pureness? What is this pureness, Maharaj? Well, 
what is what is pure devotional service? You know, we studied the nectar of devotion, our definition of pure devotional service. And you have without to ask, any material desires. Hmm? Without any material desires. Without desire for philosophical speculation or fruit of activity. And we, so, we, con we constantly serve Krishna favorably. Anya vilasita sunyam. Hmm. Anya vilasita sunyam jnana Anuko yena Krishna nu shilanam bhakti at Hmm. Yes, Maharaj. So, this is a definition of pure devotional service Rupa Goswami has given us. In proportion to our endeavor to please Krishna, Krishna will reciprocate. And so, this is describing about Devahuti. Devahuti said, to say nothing of the spiritual advancement of persons who see the Supreme Person face to face. Now, you see, actually, you're, when you go to a temple, you're seeing the Supreme Person face to face. So you're in a similar position, just as Devahuti was seeing Lord Kapila face to face, and she understood he was the Supreme Person. When we go to temple and we see the deities, we're also seeing the Supreme Person face to face. And Prabhupada also told us, when we study Srimad Bhagavatam, one day we will actually see Krishna in the pages of the Srimad Bhagavatam. The Srimad Bhagavatam is not different from Lord Krishna. It's the literary incarnation of Lord Krishna. So you're studying Srimad Bhagavatam, you're actually seeing Krishna there face to face. But even a person not, who's not doing these things, he's from a low-born, sinful family. They eat dog meat, but he immediately becomes eligible to do a Vedic sacrifice just by doing a little devotional service, chanting the holy name. So we dedicate all of our activities to the service of Krishna. So certainly we have great hope to be get to get rid of our past karma, to get rid of our previous sins, to purify ourselves. But that's not the goal. That's not the goal. The goal is not just to do a Vedic sacrifice. The goal is to develop love for Krishna. We have, to, we have to go on from this platform of, you know, just purifying ourselves and get it, getting rid of our bad karma. We have to go on from that to come to some platform where we actually become attached to Krishna. We actually want to do service to Krishna. We're so eager to see Krishna, to speak to Krishna, to be with Krishna. Right? So that's verse number six. Then verse number seven is also a very, very wonderful verse, which we should also know, right? You can also chant. Right. So these people are very glorious. They're chanting the holy name. Even if they're born in the family of dog eaters, such persons are worshipable. And so if somebody's not born in a family of dog eaters, they're born in a good, pious, religious family, they're even more worshipable if they're chanting the holy name. So persons who chant the holy name must have executed all kinds of austerities, fire sacrifices, achieved the good manners of the Aryans. They must have bathed at holy places of pilgrimage, studied the Vedas, fulfilled everything required. That's why they're chanting the holy name. 
That's a qualification to chant the holy name. But remember, chanting the holy name is the means and it's also the end. What is the end? The end is where we actually develop our love for Krishna. Srimad Bhagavatam said, remember the second canto? It said, Certainly that heart is still framed. If on chanting the holy name we don't feel ecstasy. So we have to understand the power of the holy name, the importance of chanting the holy name. Not only chanting the holy name, but it's a sign that somebody who is chanting the holy name, they're not ordinary people. They're very special people. They must have done a lot of things in the past and now they've come to that stage to be able to chant the holy name. And so this is the, the, uh, the power that the holy name brings people to the highest platform, to the stage of perfection. Okay, we'll go ahead. So text number eight. I believe, my Lord, that you are Lord Vishnu himself under the name of Kapila, and you are the Supreme Personality of Godhead, the Supreme Brahman. The saints and sages, being freed from all the disturbances of the senses and mind, meditate upon you, for by your mercy only can one become free from the clutches of the three modes of material nature. At the time of dissolution, all the Vedas are sustained in you only. So Devahutis understood the identity of her son. Actually, even before he was born, she'd already been told, she was told, that was by Lord Brahma, that she would have a child who would be an incarnation of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And of course, when, once the child comes, then it's hard, not so easy to accept that this child is actually the Supreme Lord. It wasn't like Lord Kapila came as Lord Krishna came to Vasudeva and Devaki, came in his Narayan form. Lord Kapila came like a normal child, but at the same time, uh, he's understood to be the Supreme Lord. So, this is the wonder of the Supreme Lord. This is his inconceivable potency that he can come. All right, would someone like to read this one for me now? Does the Supreme Personality of God say? Can I continue? Yeah, please continue, Mary Thank you, uh, Maharaj. Does the Supreme Personality of God here, Kapila, satisfied by the words of his mother, towards whom he has very affectionate, replied with gravity? Okay, so now we're going to hear Lord Kapila's reply. Yeah, you can read, Manaji. My dear mother, the path of self-realization, which I have already instructed to you, is very easy. You can execute this system without difficulty and by following it, you shall very soon be liberated, even within your present body. So just like Srila Prabhupada told us, the process of Krishna consciousness is not difficult, it's very easy. You just have to follow it. So you see Lord Kapiladev calling, saying the same thing to his mother. You can execute this system without difficulty and following it very soon. You'll be liberated. So what was spoken by Lord Kapila to Devahuti is the same thing Srila Prabhupada gave us today. Do you want to keep reading, Maharaji? Okay. My dear mother, those who are actually transcendentalists certainly follow my instructions as I have given them to you. You may rest uh, assured 
um, that if you <coughs> traverse um, this path of self-realization perfectly, surely you shall be free from fearful material contamination and shall immediately, uh, ultimately reach me. Mother, persons who are not conversant with this method of devotional service certainly cannot get out of the cycle of birth and death. Yes. If we, p people who don't know the path of bhakti, they'll have to stay in the wheel of birth and death. We heard that yesterday. We heard about the different people, the Grihamedes and the pious uh, materialists, and how they're endeavouring and how they're, they're maybe doing their re religious rituals. But they, they don't do them with devotion. So they remain in the material world. They may go up to the higher planets for some time and then they come back down. So this is the result. If they have no devotion, they have to stay in the wheel of birth and death. But transcendentalists, those who are actually transcendentalists, they will follow the instructions. They will follow the instructions as given to us. And we can, we can see. People follow the instructions. When you follow carefully, then you'll make progress. It may take some time. And people sometimes feel, sometimes they feel that oh, I'm, I'm not progressing. But we have to be realistic that when we practice and we follow, it doesn't mean you're going to develop a body with four arms. Sometimes people are disappointed that they didn't grow two more arms, you know, they think I should have got my forearm form. It's not like that. We follow and we remain in Krishna consciousness, we remain on the transcendental platform. That is the result of following the instructions, that it frees us from the effects of the material energy. We're no longer in maya. That's the difference. You follow the instructions of Lord Kapila or you follow Srila Prabhupada's instructions, you won't be in Maya. You'll be saved from Maya. So that's what we really want. We have to protect ourselves from the material energy. But people who are just simply materialists, the karmis, the fruit of workers, what do they get? They get their sense gratification, temporary pleasures, and they go up and down in the wheel of birth and death. But for the devotee, devotee knows. He's, he's going back to Godhead. It's just depending on when Krishna wants to take him. He surrendered to Krishna. Okay, we'll go ahead. Uh, text number 12. Is devotional service. Sri Maitreya said, the city of Godhead, after instructing his beloved mother, took and left his home, his mission having been fulfilled. His mission was to explain the Sankhya philosophy to his mother and save his mother some anxiety because her husband had gone away and left her. So by giving her the Sankhya philosophy, she... Text 13. As instructed by her son, Devahuti also began to practice Bhakti Yoga in that very ashram. That means the ashram which her husband had given her. Husband, her husband had been there originally and she'd come there and joined him. Then he went away. So she was there in the ashram and she practiced samadhi in the house of Kardama Muni, which was so beautifully decorated with flowers that it was considered the flower crown of the river Saraswati. So Kardama Muni, remember he was a mystic yogi as well as an Astanga yogi, and with his yoga powers, he'd created the aerial mansion. And so that mansion was still there for Devahuti, and she was enjoying the opulence, but 
you know, being on her own, it wasn't much of an enjoyment. Being without her husband anyway, she couldn't really enjoy it. Although it was a, a very beautiful place. Text 14. She began to bathe three times daily, and thus her curling black hair gradually became grey. Due to austerity, her body gradually became thin, and she wore old garments. So that's uh, the austerities of spiritual life, bathing three times daily. It said uh, Bra brahmacharis should bathe once a day, grihastha should bathe twice a day, sannyasis should bathe three times a day. When Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu was residing in Jagannath Puri, he was taking bath three times a day in the sea. That's quite an austerity because you know the sea water is very salty, so the salt is really, is really not very comfortable on the skin. After you bathe in the sea, you like to take a shower to get the salt water off your skin. I don't know how Lord Chaitanya did it, but he would go to the sea every day and bathe three times a day. And then the, the curling black hair of Devahuti became grey. Well, that happens to everyone, right? <laughs> As you get old, the hair, the, everything dies, everything dies. You, get, uh, you go to the dentist and he gives you root canals, the teeth are dead, gives you root canal. Uh, the, the hair goes grey, it's dead, and so the nails also, they die. Oh, so many problems with the material body, it's all dying, and one day we will also die. The, body, the whole body will die. It's the nature of the material world. And due to her austerity, her body became thin, and she wore old garments. This is like the, something like in the instructions which were given by Lord Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to Raghunath Das Goswami. Of course, Raghunath Das Goswami, he was exceptionally renounced. And when he left his home, very opulent home, and he came to Jagannath Puri, then he asked to Lord Chaitanya, he, he didn't ask directly, but through Swarup Damodar, he asked Lord Chaitanya for some instruction. And Lord Chaitanya told him, he gave the instructions that you should never speak like normal people. Don't speak the common talk and don't hear what they have to say. That's very important in the, to practice renunciation. The tongue, the, you, you cannot talk nonsense and don't hear nonsense thing. Don't hear the, the gramya kata. Gramya kata na sunibe, gramya varta na kahibe. Right? This is Chaitanya Charitamrita. And then Lord Chaitanya also gave the instruction that you should not eat opulent food and don't wear ex uh, opulent clothing also. So Raghunath was a, you know, he was a Goswami. So these Babaji's in Radha Kund, they're very renounced. They wear the cloth which only goes down to the knees. They don't wear any sewn cloth. Anyway, Devahuti, she's wearing old garments and her body became very thin. Just as before, when she had first come to live with her husband, her body had become emaciated and her hair had become matted. But then when they went to travel, they wanted to enjoy then it was arranged that when Devahuti went to bathe, her whole body would be rejuvenated. So you studied all that before. So now, anyway, she's on her own and her body has become thin. Right? Someone like to read number 15 for us? The home and household paraphernalia of Kardama who was one of the Pajapatis, was developed in such a way by dint of his mystic powers of austerity and yoga, that his opulence was sometimes envied by those who travel in outer space. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, the household paraphernalia. <laughs> People would keep their wealth in their household paraphernalia. Of course, we see that even today. Although Kadama was a mystic yogi and doing austerity, but he had so much opulence. But, of course, he's not attached to any of it. That's why he could just go away. He could renounce everything. So that's mystic power. And we see Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada had so much opulence at his fingertips, but he was not attached to any of it. He was happy to go back to Vrindavan. Okay, go ahead, Prabhu, keep reading. The opulence of the household of Dharma Muni is described here in the sheets and mattresses were all as white as the foam of milk. The chairs and benches were made of ivory and were covered by clots of lace with golden filigree. And the couches were made of gold and had very soft pillows. Mm. We can see it's uh, very opulent, isn't it? Very sounds very opulent. Everything is so nice and wonderful, ivory and gold and oh my goodness, and then lace and so many things. It sounds very very beautiful. Well, very opulent certainly. How do, how did it all come about? It's just by the mystic power. Kardama Muni is a yogi, he could do these things, he could create these things. Yeah, go ahead. The walls of the house were made of first class marble, decorated with, decorated with valuable jewels. There was no need of light, for the household was illuminated by the rays of these jewels. The female members of the household were all amply decorated jewelry. Hmm. So it sounds similar to Lord Krishna in Dwarka, that he had 16,108 palaces which were also first class marble and they were all decorated with valuable jewels. And even Hastinapur also where the Pandavas were living, there was no need of light. Everything was illuminated by the jewels which were there decorating the, the walls. So this was a system in the past. Even in the lower planetary regions, the regions below the earth, there's uh, the, these different subterranean heavenly planets, they don't enjoy the light of the sun. So the light, the light there comes from jewels. There's jewels on the heads of the different living entities and that illuminates everything. Okay, so then female members were all decorated with jewellery also. The different female members were there to assist Devahuti. She was not alone, she had different ladies there, or maids there, maid servants there, all taking care of her. And they're all decorated with jewellery, they were taken care of. Mm -hmm. Someone else like to read? Uh, test number 18, a compound of the main household was surrounded by beautiful gardens with sweet, fragrant flowers and many trees which produced fresh fruit and were all tall and beautiful. The attraction of such gardens was that singing birds would sit on the trees and their chanting voices as well as the humming sound of the bees made the whole atmosphere as pleasing as possible. So this is uh, the beauty which you find in the cities. You live in a city, in an industrial environment or something like that, you're not going to have that kind of atmosphere. No flowers, no trees with fruits. Or, so like in, in USA, in Florida, they have trees. They don't like to have fruits because fruits are a lot of trouble for them to take care of. And a mess on the roads everywhere. 
So they prefer to have trees with no flowers, no fruits. This is a Kali Yuga. But in the past, people enjoyed these things. They enjoyed fragrant flowers and trees with fruits. It's very pleasing for people. It attracts the birds. The birds also come, they enjoy to eat the fruits on the trees. If the people don't eat them, the birds will eat them. And you can enjoy their... But then, nowadays, people, they don't like birds also. Oh, they make so much noise. Oh, they make a mess everywhere. No, we don't want birds. And, <laughs> and but people have upset the whole ecology. They don't want birds. They don't want trees and flowers and fruits. What do they want? Yeah, they just want sense gratification. They just want eat, sleep, mate and defend. Don't disturb me. Go ahead, text 19, Prabhu. When devotee would enter that lovely garden to take her bath in the pond filled with lotus flowers, the sisters of the denizens of the heaven, the Gandharv, would sing about Kardam's glorious household life. Her great husband, Kardam, gave her all protection at all times. All right, so... That actually, it's important women should be protected. When they're young girls, they're protected by their father. Then they get married, the husband protects them, and in old age, the son will be there to protect them. So women need protection. And Devahuti also needs that protection. She, she feels that protection through her great husband. And She's enjoying beauty, the beauty, taking bath in the pond filled with lotus flowers. You know, we read about these things. We read about how there used to be lotus flowers in the Ganga. Nowadays, they have this, this horrible weed which grows everywhere. Instead of lotus flowers, there's this horrible weed which just dries up all the water of the rivers. So Kali Yuga going on and influencing the, the environment, destroying the environment. So Devahuti's detachment, text number 20. Although her position was unique from all points of view, saintly Devahuti in spite of all her possessions, which were envied even by the ladies of the heavenly planets, gave up all such comforts. She was only sorry that her great son was separated from her. So this is the sign of her advanced spiritual position. When Devahuti feels separation from her son, that is spiritual attachment. That is not material. In the material world, of course, the mother thinks of the child, we think of her son. That's a material relationship. But in Devahuti's case, it's a different situation because her son is the Supreme Lord. Her son is not just any ordinary child. He is the Supreme Lord. So her attachment for her son is spiritual. And that is what takes her back to Godhead because she's so attached to her son. She does not think of her son just as we would think, you know, material world, you have a son, you think, oh, my son, he will take care of me when I get old, you know. We have that idea, you know, that the son, when, when I'm old, my son will be there to look after me, my son will take care of me. But Devahuti is not thinking like that. She's just feeling separation from her son. Of course, her son had spent some time enlightening her, 
and answering all of her inquiries. But then he left. He went away and left her. So it was up to her to practice and to apply what he had taught her. And what he taught her, of course, was devotional service. So her devotion for her son was what actually he taught her. He taught her about being devoted to the Supreme Lord. So her, her son was the Supreme Lord. So her feeling for her son is her devotion. And we're encouraged to cultivate that kind of mood. Separation. That Vipralamba, right? Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all of his associates, they all practiced, they all cultivated that mood of separation. We see Chaitanya Mahaprabhu uh, displaying the mood of Radha Bhava, the mood of Srimati Radharani in ecstatic separation from Lord Krishna. When Lord Krishna leaves Vrindavan and goes to Mathura, the gopis, are, they're completely broken-hearted. They feel so much pain and separation from him. And Deva, uh, not only Srimati Radharani, but Mother Yashoda, Mother Yashoda just cried and cried and cried. Her eyes were always filled with tears in separation from Krishna. So that was the pure love of the people of Vrindavan, their separation from Krishna. So Devahuti has that feeling also of feeling separate from Krishna. This is Vatsalyaras, right? Vatsalyaras. Prabhupada explains in one purport there that just like a, uh, vat, Vatsa, Vatsa is a calf, right? So just like the cow is attached to its calf, as soon as the calf comes, then the cow will give milk and the calf can drink the milk from the mother cow. So the, the vatsa, so we say vatsauya ras, the mood of parental relationship with Krishna, thinking of Lord Krishna as our son, as our child. That is a mood of loving devotion. We're all servants. And a very advanced way to serve Krishna is by taking the Lord as your child and serving him like your own child. In the Srimad Bhagavatam, there's an example given about one couple, how they had no son. And so they were told they should worship the deity as their son. So they worshipped the deity as their son. And they arranged the marriage of the deity also. Just like the parents, when you have a son, you maybe like to arrange the marriage for your son. And so they arranged the marriage for the deity. And when they passed away, they were worried nobody would be there to do the shrad for them because they had no child. But the deity did the shrad for them. The deity personally offered the shrad for them because the deity was their son. They'd taken the deity as their son and the deity reciprocated and performed the Shrad ceremony for them. So that is the loving relationship. Devahuti, she's feeling great separation from her son. She's going to go back to Godhead and she goes to the planet where Lord Kapila is in the spiritual sky. And so she's reunited with him in, the, in Vaikuntha. Right? Okay, text number 21. Devahuti's husband had already left home and accepted the renown. Hila left home. Although she knew all the truths of life and death, and although her heart was cleansed at the loss of her son, just as a cow is affected when her calf dies. When you have, if you have a child and you lose your child, certainly you'll be affected. So like when their calf dies, then... Hare Krishna, can you hear me okay? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, yes Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. The line is very unstable just now. 
All right, so sometimes when the cow loses her calf, what they will do, they will bring the, the, the you know, a dummy calf to the cow or the, bring even the dead calf to the cow and try, to, and that way the cow will give milk. They'll try to trick the cow just so she can give milk. So, uh, Devahuti's attachment for her son was just like that, just like the cow is attached to her calf. Right. Yes? So, sorry, please go ahead, Prabhu. Okay, okay. Uh, Maharaj, may I ask one question? Yes. Maharaj, uh, you mentioned that uh, one couple, they took the deity as their son and uh, they wanted to get him married. So, uh, so the mar how the marriage was done for the deity? Like, uh, was the deity what married? So, was it kind of a I could not understand if perhaps the signal was weak or I missed it, Maharaj. Well, sometimes they do the marriage of Shaligram with Tulsi. Okay. Right? So that seen? way and, uh, and also after they passed away, so they thought that how they will serve the, uh, serve the son. And uh, so what, what basically happened after their passing away? Well, when they passed away, then the, the, the deity was the one which did the shred ceremony. Okay, well, so this is mentioned in Srimad Bhagavatam. Yes, I think there's a purport there where Prabhupada talks about it. Okay, Maharaj. And Prabhupada definitely talked about it. I, I think it's also in a purport. Yeah. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much, Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I ask a question, please? Y yes, please. Maharaj, just a few verses go you know, it was being described how Gama Muni, you know, he, uh, through his mystic power, he created this opulence. Um, also in the Ramayana, you know, when Bharat came to the ashram of uh, Bharat Vajra, I think it was, you know, the sage also created a very opulent situation for them. Um, so, sounds very similar to spiritual world, or what these sages are creating, is it more of a hip? Type of situation. What what kind of situation? Uh, more of a situation like the heavenly planets. So when they create these opulent situations, is it closer to the spiritual world or the opulence of the heavenly planets? Well, uh, yeah, we could say it's like opulence, like the heavenly planets. It could also be. You know, spiritual world, we know there's different positions, there's Vrindavan and there's Vaikuntha. And so Vrindavan, you know, Goloka Vrindavan is uh, rural, it's a place of cows and countryside and forests. It's quite different from uh, Vaikuntha, Dwarka. <laughs> right? Dwarka, Vaikuntha, uh, it, it's going to be more opulent there. Quite different from Goloka Vrindavan. And so heavenly heavenly planets, uh, certainly there'll be some opulence there. There must be opulence there. They enjoy opulence. They enjoy generally mystic powers and like that. You know, uh, they can have a long life and very good looking, very intelligent. Don't have to worry so much about disease and things like we do. You, you, Maharaj, thank you very much. You, sorry, can, you, can, sorry, read, you can read more about the situation on these different places as described step by step as Gop Kumar goes to visit all these places in the Brihad Bhagavatam Rita. In Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, Sanatana Goswami takes us through all these different places and we hear about Gop Kumar going to the heavenly planets and then going on to higher planets also and then going into the spiritual world. But we're not given elaborate information about exactly how it is, but certainly, you know, there must be some opulence there. Okay. Raj, thank you very much. I have to leave the class a little bit early, earlier today, but I just want to thank you for being such an inspiration uh, to me and I'm sure to all the devotees. 
You've given us so much of enthusiasm, conviction, and steadiness in our Krishna consciousness. I really appreciate that, and I mean, get it to you for that. And uh, I also beg forgiveness if I ask too many questions, and forgiveness if I caused any offenses at your lotus feet. <laughs> Please, oh, don't embarrass me. No, no, I'm very happy. I like questions. Intelligent people will have questions. It's nice to get questions. So thank you for your participation. Thank you for your kind words. Hare Krishna. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, and please give us your causeless mercy and blessings so that we may uh, persevere and grow in our Krishna consciousness. Oh, yes, I'm sure you will continue going on studying the <laughs> Bhakti Vai Bhav. That's a great endeavor. So I'm sure that will get, definitely be a big boost to your Krishna consciousness. Okay. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare okay, Krishna. here's text number 22. Devahuti's absorption in her son Kapila. O Vidura, thus always meditating upon her son, the Supreme Personality of Godhead Kapila Dev, she very soon became unattached to her nicely decorated home. <laughs> you could imagine a woman in a beautiful home with so much opulence, then certainly it could be very bewildering for the mind, it could become very attached to it. But then, here she is, she, her husband had renounced. Well, remember, of course you heard, you'd all read, you studied the Srimad Bhagavatam, you know how they travelled and how they enjoyed together. For some time they'd gone all the way up to Mount Meru and they enjoyed there with, where the, all the demigods go to enjoy. And then they had, she had her, her daughters and her son. And the daughters were given in marriage and she's left with the son. And then her husband tells her, now I'm going, because that was the arrangement, that when he agreed to marry her, that after we have children, then I'm going to leave. Because he, remember, he practiced, uh, he practiced Astanga Yoga for how many thousands of years? Who remembers how many thousand years Kardama Muni practiced? Anyone remember? No? I have to check it up. I think 5,000 at least. Anyway, he practiced Astanga Yoga for a long time and he was very renounced living in the forest. And then Devahuti came, brought there by Swayambhuva Manu, and he takes her for his wife. And, the, and for some time they were doing austerity, they were continuing and she was, very, she was becoming very thin and emaciated and I was describing her hair matted and everything. But then she expressed a desire to have a family, to start a family. So in order to do that, Kurdama Muni had to make some changes and he had to create some opulence create some more, some comfort and luxury living so that they could actually have more the desire for progeny. Because if, you, if your life is very austere and renowned, then you won't have the mood to want to have a family. It would be d difficult to bring a family up in a, in a place where you're very renounced and unattached. So Kardama Muni created the attachment. But then, after the children are born, then he left. And so she lost her husband. And then Kapila's teaching her. And then Kapila's also gone. And she's left alone. So was, was that cruel? Just like Lord Chaitanya. Lord Chaitanya took sannyas at the age of 24. And his wife was only six, 16 years of age with no children, and he had an elderly mother also. What, so was it wrong of Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, Mahaprabhu to do this? Would someone like to respond? Maharaj, may I respond? Yes, please, Prabhu. Uh, Maharaj, actually, uh, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, uh, actually he, his advent was for a higher purpose, to basically uh, 
uh, give the holy name to the fallen souls so that they can be delivered and at the same time he he basically because he is the supreme lord without being personally present he can take care of his mother his wife without being personally present like he he gave his deity form uh, to his wife so that she can worship him and whenever she uh, felt uh, the uh, absence of the lord she can always uh, look upon the deity given by lord chaitanya to the wife and then she can basically have the same feeling of his presence well i never heard anywhere that he gave her a deity i don't know where you got that from Imara. he simply left home he didn't he didn't even tell her that he was leaving home but he left, right? He does, he's not going to tell her. <laughs> yes, Maharaj, maybe I'm mistaken. Maybe I missed some, uh, something in between. So kindly correct me, Maharaj. Yeah, well, we, we, we never heard anywhere that Lord Chaitanya gave her a deity. Even that deity, we're not, you know, some devotees are not very sure if how, how authentic that is, that it was actually worshipped by Sachi Mata, by uh, Vishnu Priya. But that's what they say. It's not very, not, not, you know, we don't see any real evidence of this. But as you say, you know, certainly there, there's that deity there, Damishwar. How authentic it is, we don't know. But uh, why, did he, why did he go away? Was, was he ne being neglectful? But... Of course, he, he left home for the higher purpose. The higher purpose is to distribute Krishna consciousness to the world and to show the example also. Of, of course, he could have shown the example, you know, usually people take sannyas at the age of 50 or, or they renounce anyway at the age of 50. Panchasorvam vanambrajit. We say go to the forest. You don't go to the forest at the age of 24. He'd, he'd not been married very long. Your wife is only 16 and no children. And, but Chaitanya Mahaprabhu has left home. He left home for the higher cause, to preach Krishna consciousness. And actually, after he took sannyas, Sachimada came there to Shantipur and Lord Chaitanya said to her, he told his mother, he said, I, I took sannyas on the spur of the moment. I was foolish. I shouldn't have done it. I will come home with you. But Sachi Mata told him, no, no, that's not good. That will be not good. That, that will ruin your name. That will be very bad for you. So now you've taken sannyas. Now you have to take it. You have to keep it up. You have to embrace it fully. That is the mood taking sannyas, that you don't give it up, right? If you give up sannyas, then that is called vantasi, right? That's like eating your own vomit. That you vomited something, you've turned away from the material world, and then if you're going to give it up, then you're going to come back. You're going to give up the sannyas and come back. It's like eating your own vomit. It's a degrading thing to do. It's not a proper thing to do. It's condemned in the Vedic system. It's different in Buddhism. Buddhism is a different thing. In the Buddhists, you know, someone may, may be a Buddhist monk and they may give up being a Buddhist. People often become monks in Buddhism and they'll become a monk for six months or a year or even one month. And they'll, they'll often do it. And, you know, it's just for, for their purification to become a monk. And there's a ceremony when they move in and there's a ceremony when they go out. But the Vedic culture is not like that. The Vedic culture, sannyas, renunciation, is at the end of life. And there's no going back. It's a different, whole very different situation. So Kardama Muni had left home, he'd gone away. And Lord Kapil is also not going to stay at home. He's not going to stay because his mother's already perfect. She's already, he's already done everything for her. Now she, he doesn't need to stay with, stay there any longer. And, but it appears that her attachment is material, but her attachment is actually very spiritual. 
it's the highest spiritual level. Her absorption in her son. Because her son is a personality of Godhead. So she can be attached to him. Alright, text 23, who would like to read? Hare Krishna Maharaj, I've got one question, Mother. Yes, Prabhu. Maharaj. Uh -huh. uh, in this case, uh, just uh, like uh, uh, her son, uh, uh, Kapamani had left the home, and then what is the difference between her status and uh, living as a Brahmacharya? What is the difference between who? That state and uh, uh, becoming a Brahmacharya. Brahmachari and Brahmachari. Yeah. Sanyasani. Sanyas. Taking sanyas. Huh? Taking sanyas. Sanyas by a, uh, by a woman. She was in the state of sanyas. Who? Uh, Devuti. No, so, no, no. She is not sanyas. Women don't take sanyas. So what is the difference between that state and remaining in sanyas? Her status. Okay. What is the difference between her status and sannyas? Yes, my lady. Well, sannyas. The sannyas is there's no win, there's no Vedic culture. It's not in the Vedic culture that women take sannyas. Women don't take sannyas. We said women have to be protected. So other women are protected. You know, they, they stay at home. They they don't, or they stay with the husband. If the husband goes somewhere, they'll go with the husband. That's vanaprastha. But uh, they don't take sannyas. But her... in this case, if there is no son, there is no husband. Yes, there's no son, there's no husband. But she's already perfect in consciousness. She's completely elevated, fully elevated, fully attached to her son, Kapila, who is the personality of Godhead. And the other ladies are there. So many other ladies are there. We heard all the maidservants and so on, they're all there. So she's not alone. Just like women go to live in an ashram, sometimes older ladies, they'll go, there's a widow's ashram, and they'll all live together. The old ladies, the old widows, they come to, like in Vrindavan, they have widow's ashrams and the widows will live there together. And so she's there. She's got other ladies there with her. Yes, Maharaj. Thank you. And there's no men. All right. Text 23. Someone read. Yes, somebody could read, please. Thereafter, having heard with great eagerness and in, uh, in uh, all detail from her son, Kapila Deva, the eternally smiling personality of Godhead, Deva Dhuti began to meditate constantly upon the Vishnu form of the Supreme Lord. Jai. She meditates on the Vishnu form of the Supreme Lord. You see, this is her spiritual advancement. Yes, go ahead, Prabhu. She did so with serious engagement in devotional service. Because she was strong in renunciation, she accepted <coughs> only the necessities of the body. She became situated in knowledge due to realization of the absolute truth. Her heart became purified, she became fully absorbed in meditation upon the Supreme Personality of Godhead, and all misgivings due to the mode of material nature disappeared. Oh yes, we see, we can see how she's engaging herself, engaged in devotional service, strong in renunciation, accepting only the necessities of the body, minimizing the bodily demands, you see, and situated in knowledge because she'd heard in detail from her son. So her heart became purified and she 
she's meditating, absorbed in meditation on the personality of Godhead. Though she, she's free from the modes of material nature. Yes, and then text number 26. Her mind becomes completely engaged in the Supreme Lord and she automatically realizes the knowledge of the impersonal Brahman. As the Brahman realizes so of the materialistic concept of life, thus all material pangs disappear and she attains transcendental bliss. Okay. Completely engaged in the service of the Supreme Lord. And she realized the knowledge of the impersonal Brahman. She was freed from the designations. She didn't just only become Brahman realized because she's engaged in devotional service, but she was fully on the Brahman platform and she understood her situation as a servant Okay, right. Oh. Text number 27. Is somebody else here who could read? Uh, situated in eternal trance and freed from illusion, impelled by the modes of material nature, she forgot her material body, just as one for... That would be nice, wouldn't it? You forget the material body. Could you imagine that? You know, that that's, you can see just like in a dream. So we're so attached to the body, taking care of the body, but she forgot the body. Yeah? Go ahead, Prabhu, 28. Her body was being taken care of by the spiritual damsels created by her husband, Kardama, and since she had no mental anxiety at that time, her body did not become thin. She appeared just like a fire surrounded by smoke. And so earlier we heard that she'd become thin, but now here it said that she didn't become thin. Her body did not become thin. She was taken care of by spiritual damsels created by her husband. Oh, <laughs> you have to be a very special husband to be able to do things like that, you know, <laughs> not an easy thing. Yeah, go ahead Prabhu, 29. Because she was always absorbed in the thought of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, she was not aware that her hair was sometimes loosened or her garments were disarrayed. Hmm. So that is real detachment from the material, but it, you see she's absorbed in the thought of the Personality of Godhead, who is Kapila Dev, who is her son. She was absorbed in thought of him. Yes, go ahead. Yes, Maharaj. Uh, my dear Vidura, by following the principles instructed by Kapila, Deva Huti soon became liberated from material bondage and she achieved the Supreme Personality of Godhead as Super Soul without difficulty. Hmm. Without difficulty. She followed the instructions without difficulty. She soon became liberated from material bondage. That is the success of life. That is the success of life, that you get out from this material world. Material life, we're thinking success, you know, we build a, build a big home, we have a nice car, all these things, that, that is not success. That is nothing, that is useless. All very temporary, all flickering. The real success is to get freed from material bondage. We have to understand very clearly what is the goal of life. And Srimad Bhagavatam is really enforcing that on us, making it very clear for us to understand what is the real business in this life. Don't be illusioned. So Devahuti's destination is described there, text number 30. 
there are innumerable Vaikuntha planets predominated by the expansions of Vishnu. There is also a Vaikuntha planet known as Kapila Vaikuntha to which Devahuti was promoted to meet Kapila and reside there eternally, enjoying the company of her transcendental son. Text number 30, Purpur. So, Devahuti, because her mind was absorbed in the thought of her son, the time of death, she went there. Yam yam vapismaram bhavam chajite anti kalevaram. Right? Whatever we remember at the end of life, we'll go there. The end of. So that's, that's the result. So she was thinking of Lord Kapila, who is the personality of Godhead, and he has his planet in the spiritual sky, and she went there, and she's there now with Lord Kapila. You know this place? This is Siddhapada. This is where Devahuti, Devahuti, her body transformed into water, right? The palace where Devahuti achieved her perfection, my dear Vidura, is understood to be a most sacred spot. It is known all over the three worlds as Siddhapad. Dear Vidura, the material elements of her body have melted into water and are now a flowing river, which is the most sacred of all rivers. Anyone who bathes in that river also attains perfection, and therefore all persons who desire perfection go bathe there. But, yes, Maharaj. I don't know where it is. <laughs> I don't know. Gujarat Maharaj. Is it? It's in Gujarat. Yes. Huh. Yes. Pad. Which part yes. of Gujarat? Saurashtra? All Siddhapur. And there's this place, Siddhapad? There's a river there, oh. Siddhapad? Is it North Gujarat or is it Saurashtra or where? Exactly, uh, I have to find out. You haven't been there? I haven't been there. Who told you it's in Gujarat? I was in Gujarat, so I know. You heard about it when you were in Gujarat? Yes. Okay. I'll look into that. Thank you very much. It, the district it's mentioned as Patan. I'll Let, find out exactly and let you know, Maharaj. Oh, thank you. Okay, and here's Kapil Muni's temple. My dear Vidura, the sage Kapila, the personality of Godhead, left his father's hermitage with the permission of his mother and went towards the northeast. While he was passing in the northern direction, all the celestial denizens known as Characha, Charachas and Gandharvas, as well as the Munis and the damsels of the heavenly planets, prayed and offered him all respects. So notice, he took permission from his mother before, before he left. All right, yes, you can go. That's what you want to do, you want to go, go. She didn't force him, that, oh no, you stay with me. She accepted that. And so he went to the north, and. The great, the heaven, the, the den. Oh, here's the comparison between the Sankhya. We didn't really discuss anything about the atheistic Sankhya. It is something you have to know, you should be familiar with what is this atheistic Sankhya, because it's mentioned there are different atheistic philosophies. And when it mentions that there are six atheistic philosophies, one of them is Kapila. Kapila Sankhya Yoga, but it is not the, it is not the Kapila we know. The, Kap, the Sankhya philosophy taught by Lord Kapila, who is the son of Devahuti, that is not atheistic. 
But the philosophy taught by the atheistic, there's another Kapila who is an imposter, and he also pre presented Sankhya philosophy, but it's totally atheistic. And here you can see the comparison. The atheistic philosophy, they teach that everything comes from matter. The atheistic philosophy, they're saying life comes from matter. You see, it's mentioned here. Uh, the cause of creation, prakriti. The atheists say prakriti. They, they don't believe in God. They don't believe there's a God. It's an atheistic philosophy. There's no God. So, here you can see uh, the difference. The cause of creation, we say the Lord's glance, right? how the Supreme Lord glances over the material nature and impregnates the living entities. But they say everything just comes about from matter. And the cause of suffering, they say also matter. The cause of suffering is matter and the matter is false, it's all illusion. You can see something similar to Buddha's philosophy. Buddhist philosophy says everything is illusion, nothing is real. We say the cause of suffering is due to identifying with the prakriti. We are thinking the prakriti is for our enjoyment. We are thinking we are the master and the prakriti is there for our pleasure. So our misidentification with prakriti is the cause of suffering. And then the concept of truth. We say the jiva is the servant, and we say life comes from life. The jiva is the servant of Ishwara, but their idea is the jiva is himself the Ishwara, and everything is done by matter. Spirit comes from matter. <laughs> That's their idea. Spirit comes from matter. And they have the different, you can see the different processes. Our process is to surrender to Krishna, devotional service with knowledge of Sankhya and mystic yoga. And their process, analyze the elements, practicing mystic yoga and separating the soul, which is material, to get liberation. The soul is material because the soul is coming, the understanding of spirit is totally atheistic. We speak about Lord Kapila, it's atheistic philosophy. That's what people know because it's in line with their materialistic thinking, supported by the atheistic Sankhya philosophy. Nobody had heard of Devahuti, of Devahuti Putra philosophy. It's only due to Srila Prabhupada's preaching that people know now that there's a, a, another Bhagavad philosophy. Here is Lord Kapila's temple at Ganga Sagar. When, if you go to Ganga Sagar, you can see the temple there. And we're building a big ISKCON temple there just now. It's under construction. It's going to be quite a big temple also. I don't know when it will be ready. Construction is having some difficulties just now. But, the, you know, somebody put up a lot of money. They wanted a big temple built there and it is being done. So, you get the chance. You go to see Ganga Sagar. This is at maybe Ganga Sagar Mela, which was already passed there in January, beginning of January, month of Mag, beginning of Mag. Many people, thousands of people go. And there's Lord Kapila. You can see Lord Kapila. This is Lord Kapila at Ganga Sagar. You can see the deity there in the the red color. This is look. Okay, let's see what happened. Okay. So Lord Kapila, he's residing there even today. Those who have spiritual vision, they can see Lord Kapila there at Ganga Saga. And here is the fruit given to us. You see Maitreya speaking to Vidura. My dear son, since you have inquired from me, I have answered, O sinless one. 
The descriptions of Kapila Dev and his mother and their activities are the purest of all pure discourses. Okay. Text 37. The description of the dealings of Kapila Dev and his mother is very confidential. Anyone who hears or reads this narration becomes a devotee of the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is carried by Garuda, and he therefore enters into the abode of the Supreme Lord to engage in the transcendental loving service of the Lord. So you can see it's really a blessing. We're told this is very confidential, the descriptions of Lord Kapil and his mother. Not everybody will take the time, and have the patience to go through Srimad Bhagavatam and to come across these and read it carefully. But anyone who hears and reads this narration, they'll become a devotee of the Supreme Lord. So, very wonderful. So, we should feel very fortunate that we had the opportunity to go through this Kapila Shiksha. Are there any questions? No, Mataji's hand is up, Maharaj. Yes, Mataji. Maharaj, Maharaj, could you give, uh, please paste the Kapila, uh, San, uh, Kapila Sankhya and Atheist Sankhya slide once more? I, one thing left. That, this, that's in your book, in your student book, you know. If you yes, have... yes, Maharaj, that's just wish to, okay, just uh, confirm the points which are left. Okay, let me see. Uh, you want me if to? If possible, if it's possible. Yes, uh, we'll go back. Uh huh. Here. You see it? Yes, Maharaj. Thank you, Maharaj. Okay. Have you you got it all? Everything? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah, yes, Maharaj. Thank you. Yeah, it's very important. You should know this. The, comparing the atheistic to the theistic, right? We're not atheists. We're theistic. We're monotheists. That sometimes puzzles people. They're puzzled to know Hare Krishnas are because they think all Hindus are. Uh, they think Hindus are generally poly, polytheists. They think they believe in many gods, but we're monotheists. We believe in one God. One there's one supreme personality of Godhead, but He has many forms. So Lord Kapila is one of the forms of the personality of Godhead. Right? We want to understand properly the position of Lord Kapila. Okay, are there any other questions? Nobody's hands up, Maharaj. Can I speak for a minute? Yes, please. On behalf of Mayapur Institute and all the students present here, Maharaj, we thank you for your wonderful sessions and for your kind cooperation and giving your valuable knowledge and mercy to everybody. And everybody here is seeking your mercy, Maharaj. So please bless them and so that they can do their Bhakti Vaibhav successfully and follow the footsteps of Srila Prabhupada and all the Acharyas and fulfill the mission and vision of Srila Prabhupada. Yes. Thank you. Thank, I want to thank all of the devotees for giving me the opportunity to present this Kapila Shiksha. And I certainly wish you all the best in your continued studies. Thank you so much for the participation. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Yeah. Go thank you. Go thank you. Thank you. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna Prabhu. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.